the thing, right. the thing about those statues though my first question is why was the statue put up because if it was to celebrate slave ownership then of course it shouldn't be there if it was which is more likely i suppose in most cases for something else that they did in their lives then you can always find something that somebody's done wrong mm. recording boom because mm-hmm. the truth is kept secret it's swept under the rug if you never know truth then you never know love where's the love y'all i don't know where's the truth y'all i don't know <laughs> okay so today we'll be talking about historical memory uh, of the national kind luckily we have with us a man despite his italian name who was born and raised in germany deutschland that would be me i guess <laughs> it's not then <laughs> it's not but then, but then also i suppose we've got two brits here who we've recently been scrutinized i'd say for for not taking um a lot of our history we're meant to be proud of whereas a lot of people have been bringing up some some naughty things that the brits did in the past right and that's that's come to light for all the uh all these black lives matter protests and stuff like that i'd say Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can we start with you sal so how is german history taught in german schools okay so um First of all, you have to consider that the last time I went to school was quite a long time ago. So I'm not sure how it's being taught today. I imagine similar to the way I I was taught. So the funny thing is when you go to the German, through the German school system, um, whether you're German or not, obviously um, a big focus is being put on the history, the most recent history of Germany and all the implications, all the um, the aftermath of um, global politics, um, but also the question of how could something like that happen. And of, obviously I'm talking about Second World War, in case you slept through this last 10, 20 seconds of our uh, conversation. Um, so yeah, Germany puts a big weight on teaching both history but also responsibility i would say and um yeah i'd say a big focus like a big chunk of the school system kind of tries to process uh both uh, you know the historical and the scientific part but also the guilt and the psychological part so in a way that's how, how i felt and you have to consider i'm uh, i have the italian citizenship and uh, you know i uh, even though me and also other, um, let's say, immigrants who went through the, to the German school, even ourselves felt guilty for the German uh, war uh, after we left school. So they did a good job at that. And so, yeah, you can uh, discuss furthermore um, details about that. But that's basically what they do. They teach you about it. They make you aware of it. And in a way, it's kind of a psychological process you go through when you go to school. In so Germany. Sal, are, you, are you saying they teach you to to be guilty or how to not be guilty? No, I mean they don't teach you literally to be guilty. However, um, I mean you feel both shocked and ashamed if you are open to it. In a sense, if you are not completely blind, because th- I mean it's obviously the history part. And if you're a young kid, especially in the young age, it can be very boring. Whatever you know, it's an yeah. abstract concept. It feels like something that's not doesn't appertain to you, uh, doesn't um, touch you personally. But then we also did things like school trips and we went to a constant Nazi camp. And there it's a whole different story because the way the museum was set up, um, it really makes you understand and feel what happened there, you know? And there's also dozens of movies that documentaries and discussions and um, <clears throat> yeah, it goes quite deep. So, yeah. So is, is the purpose there, Sal, do you think, to make you feel guilty? No. Well, or just to make you aware? I don't think that, 
I don't think the, the end goal is to make you feel guilty, but I think um, the goal is to avoid another episode like that. And so to make you really understand how inhumane it is and how wrong it is. And at the same time, they try to analyze how did it, what happened to uh, get there and how can we avoid getting there again? And so also the things that they teach um, in Germany are set up that, so that you don't fall into the same uh, traps as back then. That's why they're very sensitive to right-wing parties. But I mean, it's still a problem in Germany. It's way less a problem, it seems, as it is in the United States um, on the surface. But... Um, yeah, there's there's huge backlash in society against anything. Well, one would think, even though uh, I guess the numbers speak a different language, because the AfD, the right wing party, has some ups and you know gets gains um, electors at times. I think now they're losing again a few, but you know it's always a struggle with the extreme right um, uh, spectrum, let's say, of politics that everything that goes beyond the normal conservatives, you know. Mm. But yeah, that's. Um, how I felt when I went to the through the school system in Germany. Well, how is it uh, from the British pr perspective? I guess you both went to the school in the UK. Yeah. What did Mr. Q teach you, James? Can you remember? Mr. Q. <laughs> Mr. Q. Mr. Q was our, was <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like Star Trek. <laughs> Mr. Voss taught me. Have a history point. <laughs> Mr. Voss. Um, no, I'm just trying to think of the ways in which we may have addressed uh, atrocities in our own past, mm. and I don't mm. think we did. Mm. Um, Why? Yeah, what did the, what did the, what did the British do? Of... Sorry, sir? What did the British do? Well, maybe maybe that's it. Maybe there were, maybe there were no naughty secrets to reveal. Maybe there were no unsavory episodes. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, things like the Empire. Uh, ah, I've seen right. a few calls recently that. to. I've seen a few calls recently to um, reform the the curriculum to include a bit more of the British Empire, and a lot of the details of the British Empire are um, savage. Uh, there was a lot of stealing, uh, a lot of killing, um, not a lot of permission, and and that's that's just not taught. Um, I, I think what people look angry at as well is 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 it something to do with the name Great Britain? To do with how they how they got that name was because they were ruling everyone back then, and I suppose the way it's framed and taught historically is that it is still a good thing and we are great Britain. Whereas really, you know, the way that people look at things nowadays, especially with all this kind of, uh, I don't know why I want to tie it to Black Lives Matter. I can't make the link there, but you know what I mean? The way, the way people are conscious about things like this now, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't call any of that great. It's almost something you should be ashamed of, but there's definitely not a feeling like that in our, I can't really remember a lot about history lessons, but there's definitely not a yeah. feeling like that about it, that there was anything wrong. Right, right. Um, so, so the link to Black Lives Matter, then, I suppose, could be that um, a lot, a lot, a lot of our most prominent um, politicians and public personalities were also slave owners. Right. So, there's the example of Cecil Rhodes, who has a, a statue up at Oxford University, I believe. Um, and I don't think the statue is up for him being a slave owner. The statue is up because he was a contributor to the school, um, a ph ph philanthropist in, in the community. But he did also own slaves. Um, so that sort of, what would you call it, historical revisionism, saying, well, look, if you... If you've done a, if you've done something that we that we should consider a crime, then you should be deleted. And I suppose that's the next step of the discussion. What do you do with this? 
uh, I mean, unsavory history. In Germany, it's very obvious that um, they're not trying to delete any of it. It's quite the contrary. And I mean, ever since uh, the World War ended, there was no lack from e from any side, like from the American side, all the propaganda movies against Nazism, uh, as well as against the Soviet Union back then. But also on the German side, all the uh, anti-war movies, all the um, documentaries, all the museums that have been put up. Um, I, I mean, it's it's quite recent, you know. There was quite a big chunk of people still alive. I mean, now still a few th survivors are still there, I suppose. Not many, uh, but enough. Um, there are still people around that saw the whole horror, you know, mm. and uh, that are witnesses to what happened not too long ago. And, and so I guess it's also the vicinity to the event itself that maybe led to a completely different Germany and also maybe in the spirit of, I mean, Germany was completely bombed to a flat piece on earth. So yeah. maybe there was also the spirit of re, uh, a restart, you know, coming out of the ashes, reborn and having this, Obviously, a lot of people, you know, survived and thought that they were Nazis before and they were not Nazis afterwards. I'm, sh I'm sure there was plenty of those uh, hiding as well. But I would say generally as a collective um, psychological phenomenon, I think Germany really switched for the most part to this even anti-war sentiment. I mean, today there is no super strong German military. I mean, compared to, especially back then, it's a, it's a joke. I mean, it's still one of the highest funded militaries in Europe, but still it's um, nothing compared to back then. And I think that's also on purpose. I don't think Germany wants a super strong military anymore, you know. Um, they feel a strong sense of responsibility. I mean, one could be very cynical and feel like Germany just wants to rule Europe now through politics and through other means. Um, and the Euro and all these things are just a German secret plot to take over Europe again. Okay. But I... I have a feeling and, you know, uh, I think there is some proof for that, that actually Germany really wants to help out other countries and and ha is trying to balance, obviously, national interest, but also the image um, the and, and the judgment of other countries around them. I mean, the best, best example is just a few years ago when the whole immigration crisis started, no? And Merkel said, we, we, we can do it. Wir schaffen das was the very famous German phrase. Um, so they, I think they accepted a million immigrants um, from Syria mainly. And now some are criticizing that decision back then. Um, and they claim it was based, you know, just on optics and on naive um, points of view and whatever. But I think that shows how Germany actually actively wants to up to this day, kind of make up for what they did um, during Second World War. And so I think, and there's, I don't see um, this, this phenomenon of, you know, tearing down statues and this and that. Uh, as you see in the United States, rather they have museums and you can actually see the, see the cruelties there um, in, in detail. Well, actually, it's not quite true. If you think about cancel culture, Mein Kampf by Hitler, for example, was banned in Germany until not too long ago. It was banned through a legal trick, I believe, if I'm not, um, if I don't remember incorrectly, and that is there was a copyright on the book by um, by a um, what do you call it uh, by a distributor, uh, uh, publisher. A publisher, publisher, exactly. And so they could withhold the printing of the book. I think the copyright now has expired a few years ago. And so now in Germany, I guess you can buy it again, but I think all publishers agreed on that it's just being printed with a lot of footnotes and explanations and putting things into context. Everything crossed out. But actually, uh, thinking of it, for example, the book was not allowed to be purchased in Germany for a long time. So I guess there were certain aspects of cancel canceling. I guess, I guess it was selective selective um selective display of of, the, of history in a controlled frame um rather than having people research by themselves and you know maybe the fear that mein kampf could become a memorabilia of certain fascist groups which i guess they bought it somewhere else um right and if you compare that to well if you go to china for example i went to beijing 
mm-hmm. 10 years ago, and you can buy Mao's little red book everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's the same, same in Italy. You can buy just a store nearby where you can buy <clears throat> uh, bottles of wine with Mussolini printed on it, and I think Hitler's face on it as well, and I think also with Stalin on it. So, I, I mean, there's... I guess it depends on on the country, um, like especially the, to- the topic of Nazism and fascism in Germany is a very delicate one. At least it was one when I uh, went through the school system there and when I lived there. And so the idea that somebody could print a bottle with Mussolini and Hitler on it and sell it in a store w- was very and still is in a way very alien to me. So when I see it in a in a shop here, here, here in Rome, I still, Rome, yeah, as here as, as here in Rome, yeah, because this podcast is. We are living in Rome at the moment. And, um, oh yeah, uh, there's a few shops like that. There's also some, I mean, I saw it also in other parts of Italy, especially when you go towards the north, uh, north um, let's say around Lombardy, uh, there's lo- lots of bars with Mussolini pictures hanging in the in the bars and pubs. So yeah, every country, I guess, processes their history, their collective history differently. And yeah. yeah, in Germany, anyway, I think they take it very serious. But I also feel like, and it's it's a, an observation, so it's more of a gut feeling. So I have no stats to back that up. That the young generation is not as informed or as um, yeah as informed about the topic as as the generation before, and in both directions, in the sense that some protest against Nazism where there is none, and some um don't see it where there obviously is anti-semitism which is uh, also growing in germany again unfortunately so yeah that's, that's my, that's my feedback comparison you might know there's how about hitler's book and because the argument with about people tearing down the statues even if they have done wrongdoing with a lot of people said well you, you need it there to remind you why it shouldn't happen but uh, yeah i guess it's interesting to talk about why why that's good to go through, but Hitler's book isn't. And like you say, maybe it's just, they've just left it a bit of time and now they're happy to put it out there because the, the chance of it, I don't know, catching any wind again isn't is small now that it's not been around for a long time. But yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Where's the line with it? With the, it? Thing, right. the thing about those statues, though, my first question is why was the statue put up? Because if it was to celebrate slave owners, Ship, then of course it shouldn't be there. If it was, which is more likely, I suppose, in most cases, for something else that they did in their life, then you can always find something that yeah. somebody's done wrong. And I know that slave ownership is, you know, quite far on the scale of mishaps and, uh, you know, errors. But when you start down that road, it, it's not always obvious to me where you stop. And you can always, because all statues of human beings are of flawed human beings, because, you know, somewhere along the line, uh, the person would have made a mistake. Um, you may as well rip them all down. Wasn't well, um, your man in Brits- that's- it was different? different type do you you know much about the bristol statue because this guy was actually a slave trader and that was his main business or something like that i don't know whether i'm Mm. mistaken there right and they got thrown in the river in bristol and Mm. i think the argument was kind of well no matter what he did after that that was how he came to you know that was his success in the first place so just because he came back and put it you know say it was up for his philanthropy Mm. kind of rose to fame for the wrong reasons anyway you know was the argument and I've sort of understood that a bit more I mean the slave owners is one thing because like you say maybe you couldn't even compete back then unless you were a slave owner you know you wouldn't go anywhere I, I, that that probably was the case wasn't it if all your business competition has slaves and, and you're paying everyone a fair wage you're not gonna compete you know but when your main business is as a slave trader and then you'll be in celebrated years down the line you can mm. kind of understand p- people's anger at that statue and the other thing was with that statue well i think they they there was a big lot of campaigns over the years to get it taken down but it just never got any track they no one ever took it seriously and so i mean i guess they saw the opportunity and ripped it down just to justify 
The no. problem there is the they. Who's the they? Yeah, it's yeah. Just a mob. It's an angry mob. And yeah. so, you know, if 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 our decisions in society are, are going to start being made by angry mobs, that's not the kind of society that I want to live in. Ah, uh, no. Yeah. So top timing mean, maybe was, yeah, was off. But yeah, just, yeah uh, I mean. They should just do it like with the with the you know adult movies. Just put a warning on the on those statues in the beginning, and uh, then you know what you what you're getting into. It's all about putting things into context. Yeah. And if you can handle watching uh, at the statue by yourself, then maybe you should call your mom and your dad and you're know, watching the, at the statue together with them. I mean, it's exactly what you said before. We can tear down all the statues. We live in Rome, uh, James and, and myself. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of statues of people like Julius Caesar. And uh, all the emperors and a lot of popes and a lot of other dubious people who had dubious lives with a lot of slaves, a lot of power, a lot of lavish lifestyle, a lot of very dubious decisions. The Colosseum was built by slaves. Rip it, it down. Was, exactly. <laughs> and, and it killed a lot of, a lot of people uh, from Christians to um, slaves from all over the place, you know. Right. So you could see it then through the lens of it's a it is um an object of oppression and it is but then it can also be something else it can also be a symbol of you know of a, a certain time it can be a warning it can be a lesson you learn it can be also a transformation and a, and it can be a symbol of change as you look how things were back then and how they are now today is a peaceful place where you can eat ice cream next to it and uh, you know it's a, a it's a museum where you can actually learn something. So, I mean, it's a discussion definitely to be had. I think we should have it before we tear down everything and then, and then it's too late, you know? Yeah. That's it. I agree there. And it's too late. And we are at 21 minutes. Yeah. Oh. 21 minutes. Ta, ta, ta. Brilliant. 21 minutes to go. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sal, for your, your experience and your wisdom. Just the point of just a point of view well interesting opinion. point of view it's a point of view that we didn't <laughs> grow up with the ginger fox and I so yeah I mean, it's all very glad, relevant glad I could share make Britain great again <laughs> <laughs> make statues great again alright to our listeners ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for watching this episode of the three headed hydra podcast we are three heads <laughs> we are the hydras Joshua uh, James Sell and uh, yeah tune in Subscribe. Stay healthy, uh, people. Bye.